Jake Martin. He's on he's on Jabber. He's on Jabber. Yeah. 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 Oh. Hello. Okay. I check some, check some. Check. <laughs> Sharing the stage with me today is Thomas Haynes. Sounded sultry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know the uh, the DJ and the Warriors. The Warriors come out and play. They have the sultry black woman who does the DJing. No. It's a, the gang that's running through New York. In the Warriors. Yeah. No. It was, so it's a, a Sunday night movie. Where they, the, my yoga, one of my yoga instructors okay. sounds just like this lady from the movie, and I love it when she's like, just relax. I'm like, Warriors, come out and play. <laughs> I'll look it up. Right. Um, I was expecting Spencer to be on, but he's not. <laughs> Bastard. Uh, <laughs> Um, <laughs> sleeping. Uh, Chuck? Lever? It's not on. Is Eisler in Prague? Yes. <laughs> I, don't, I know that for a fact. I drank buckets of beer in I drank some beer. Okay. Can I wait one more minute? <laughs> Just in case. No. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> You know that yeah, elevators yeah, yeah, yeah. are incredibly I slow. Lost. You actually lost. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe not because you know, in one because you're here. <laughs> <laughs> so you yeah, there's, there's a couple ways of looking at this. <laughs> the long view or the short view. <laughs> did you pay? I, 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 did you pay? I'm trying to go to it. I was really <laughs> drunk at the time. <laughs> I only did that on purpose once, by the way. Yes. But seriously, I did it once just to kind of keep things at a low roar. But, um, I think somebody actually didn't show up. So. <laughs> Hmm. I'm going to go by internet time. I can start five after. Oh, it's five after. Are we ready? Yep. You're up. Okay. Next slide. Uh, sign the blue sheets. If you don't sign the blue sheets, nobody will like us anymore. Um, and oh, that's an old. Go back. Go back. Um, that it's now it's an organization, not email. We'll fix that. Spencer and I keep reusing the same slides all the time. So <laughs> um, the note well is correct. You would have read it, or you would have had a, gone through an interstitial on your way to registration to read the note well. Um, so everything you say here is important to the IDF. And if you haven't read the note well, it, by the way, if you haven't read the note well, it does change every once in a while, not significantly in content, but it does change. So I occasionally read it. Okay. Do you update on the slides? Yes. I, by the way, I verified that Spencer pulled the correct note well and he, cause he did these slides. Okay. Um, this is our agenda for today. Is there any ads or? Any need for us? I yes. I have a very, uh, very short. I'll make a comment on the whole thing. Just find out where it's at. Uh, can I put you after? Uh... Yeah, put me at the end. Oh, okay. There's time. Okay, yeah, that's good. No, we got time. Yeah, I think like a two hours extra. Okay. <laughs> Draft. Yeah. 
Okay. Any any other additions? Anything? I'll fix this later. This is PDF. Um, okay. Uh, one more comment. Uh, <laughs> uh, Spencer and I, between us, sometimes have a lack of communication. Uh, the minutes for the 92nd meeting did not get posted with the materials, though I had them and they exist in the ether and they are in various mailboxes throughout the universe. Um, I'm going to attach them to the 93 minutes instead of trying to figure out, because I, I think I can't. Spencer tried to get them posted, but he missed the cutoff, so. You can? Yeah. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you. Okay. I, I, my problem was I asked for a review of the minutes and that was where the, so I will just post them as they are. Okay. And now on to Tom. That's just complicated stuff. I can just put it, so, oh, I see what you're doing. It's full screen. That works. I know. Yeah. I'll it works. do it for you. Um, speakers, you must stand within the pink box. <laughs> so I, I respect. Uh, wait, <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Yeah. And they don't, they don't have a vertical pink box because I'll. Right. I mean. <laughs> okay. Good. All right. Uh, so where this role came from and who gave it to me, I don't know, but I'm now the document editor. Let's have an update. Yeah. Uh, success. Well, we got RFC 7569 passed. Uh, this is the registry for the um, labeled NFS, among other things. But in case anyone else wants to start using the different Mac models, they could. So it's not specifically tied to V4. Uh, what needs to progress? So what needs to progress is we have the 4.2 and the RPSEC GSV3 documents that have passed working group last call and are stuck somewhere after that with our doc with our working group chairs. So, so, so what's the process now? Is there a shepherd? Is that the idea? Uh, Spencer should be shepherding them. Yeah. And uh, I ask every two or three weeks. Uh, and and <laughs> No wonder he's not online. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he read my slides last night. That's why he's not online. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's it's just the process. I mean. No, I know. I'm just I'm just curious. Yeah. Uh, I was hoping to to go to Mon with this. So. Okay. Uh, so I don't have time to find the update Spencer gave me. I think he mentioned uh, shepherding. Okay. This document. Um, I apologize. I will. Oh, it's all right. Find out. He, he, I'll find out what's yeah. going on. Okay. Uh, the third one is the, the flex files. We want to take it to working group last call again, and then on to the ISDG. I'd, I'd like to actually get it in the same round, but it, I don't want to wait the other two on it. And I'll give a presentation later on the flex files. All right. Um, okay. Let's see if I have another slide. No, no more slides on this. That's it. Okay. Yeah. And then the other documents either have representatives here or, well, they all have representatives here. So we'll just cover them now. Okay. I'm free. Damn it. Okay. Um, Mark, you're up. Um, and I will, uh, Spencer and I did have a long conversation before I came out here, the notes of which I don't have right now. Um, I'll, uh, I'll get a comments to you on the shepherding and stuff. I'll get that out. Wait a minute. Oh, I have the, I have them backwards. That's why it's. Sorry. There. Okay. Hello, my name is Mark Eschel, and I worked on this uh, well document and presentation with Manuj. Actually, he did most of the documents. Um, next. So um, we're trying 
want to promote extended attributes to the NFS protocol uh, based on the fact that it's widely supported on most uh, OS file systems. Uh, we are aware that there is no general standard, so we, we, we're trying to keep it simple uh, and flexible. Um, you know, today it's very uh, annoying to customers that you know they copy file over NFS and they lose the extended attributes that they use very commonly. Um, I, I believe that there is a strong co um, interest in the community um, to edit. Uh, and uh, some of the comments that are coming back, you know, why not name attributes? Uh, you know, we tried it, it didn't go anywhere. So this is uh, a simpler, um, easier uh, set of RPCs to implement. Can, okay. can someone remind me of the history here? Here it is. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Okay. Um, no, but this is like early history. Oh, before, uh, for name attributes? Yeah. I like in, in like the early days of this, I thought the whole point of something was to provide extended attribute support, uh, resource forks, things like that. Right. I mean, I wasn't involved in, with the yeah. name attribute effort, but you know, Andy and other people uh, try to implement it. And, uh, yeah. The, the names the attributes for NFS before uh, do not match well. Okay. You know, being able to uh, open, you know, files and file descriptors and such, and then get it ex address is uh, is hard. Okay. Well, that's a completely different model. It's, it's a like totally different, different model. completely different model of thought, right? I mean, name headers is basically you have a file, but it's hidden. Yeah, it's a hidden file, and then ex headers are just arbitrary name attributes. Yeah. Right. The idea behind them is it's much more lightweight tagging <laughs> mechanism. Uh, anyway, so the actual extended attributes that you know I started promote about two years ago and presented it in those uh, different meetings. If anybody is interested, but um, hopefully now after two years, uh, we'll you know start to make some track and uh, get uh, you know the draft going. Uh, yes. So what are we proposing? Uh, we want a simple, clear interface, basically for operation, get, set, list, and remove extended attributes. Um, we want it to be you know, well-defined, but um, again, simple and flexible. Um, the objection in the past, you know, people immediately were associating it with extended attributes on uh, and Linux, the issues with the different uh, prefixes of security and trusted. We're not going to get into that. Uh, this is just basically user application extend attributes that um, are completely opaque um, to the client and, and, the, ser and the server. Mark, and what's that mean? That you, you cannot interpret. I mean, you have a key and a tag. There's no meaning to any But it other. means the application can interpret it or? Not the server. I mean, obviously, I mean, cannot, you cannot, you know, hide in, you know, <laughs> this is what I mean, you know. Um, it, it's it's a basically. A, a so th this is in reference that <clears throat> the, the Linux X Center system call interface is a complete mess of use for tons of different things. For example, apples and security attributes are implemented that way. And it's by having common code split up the key into different components. And if they match some pattern, the value might actually be interpreted as well. So, but I mean, if I read this sentence, it says no one can use it. You, you can't use it's opaque to the client, it's opaque to the no, server. The client, the soft client. Application implementation. All right. Right. I mean, on the client will obviously. Yeah, I mean, the, I assume that the NFS server on, on the Linux will probably put user if he needs to. Uh, it's like it's like the file data. I mean, right. the NFS client is interpret the file data. It just 
So, and, you know, we, we discouraged, you know, uh, doing implementation that actually, you know, we cannot prevent somebody from putting whatever they want in the key. And, but, you know, if, if they're going to uh, do that, they're going to make it non interoperable, which is, you know, not the purpose of NFS protocol. So the, the four basic operations that are, we're going to have is uh, list the name of the attributes. It's a list of keys, uh, given a key, um, get the external attributes or the value associated with that, uh, set up an external attribute, which is uh, given a, a value and a key, um, basically set it, save it. And um, given a key, just remove that external attribute. Um, we're going to have a new um, a recommended attributes at the basic get attribute uh, operation that basically will tell a client if external attributes are supported or not. And then we're going to have four new RPCs to implement the get set list and remove external attributes. We're also going to add two. <coughs> so, I have a on the, uh, so the optional operation is, is it possible that so the, the way we try to structure that in the various minor version documents is that it, the, those the, the set of X adder operations is optional. Uh, set of, sure. Right, but if you're going to implement one of them, you have to implement all of them. Yeah. Would kind of this order make sense to only have the hidden list of hidden read yeah, yeah. Not really working. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's Right. You you reintroduce a feature and every and it's optional. But the, the feature itself is, I see, including all operations. Yeah. Right. But the components you can yeah. Um, I assume if you have read only you will set you'll just return, you know, you can no no permission or whatever. So another main thing that might Playing to your later talk, weren't we supposed to not to introduce recommended attributes or operations in the minor version? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it couldn't be recommended in, in, in the first version. No, the the recommendation is to have just the bit that says you support it. Yeah, but you can't, you, you. You can't say it's re it's not required. Well, I think it's the language. It's not required. You should have it, but you're, it's not mandatory that you have it. Sure, I mean, that's yeah. what it's recommended. I think that's what Chris was asking. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and um, associated with the operations, we will have uh, two uh, SS is bitmaps to basically for the two get and list operation. Uh, uh, permission to see or read and to set and remove um, another ace to basically equipment to read and write uh, permissions. Next. So that's basically what I'm um, going to more details of, you know, uh, the draft. We're going to have a new uh, bit in the get attributes that will tell you if this is supported or not. Next and some definitions of uh, what is extended attributes basically you know it's a key uh, a name and a value uh, and you know defining the two new uh, bits for permissions get out get uh, extended attributes basically um, you're given an you know given a name you're going to get back a value um, there was one one uh, comment um, on on the draft already. There isn't much detail here, but uh, actually the only comment that came back on the draft that was posted by Manu's from Christoph and Benny about uh, error. what is the error that um, you can get if basically the value that you are about to return is bigger than the negotiated session. Um, uh, I, I think that the best would be just to invent a new return code that would be very specific. 
some of the existing return because they have all kind of other uh, meaning. You know, it's not big enough, but come back with a bigger buffer or something like that. And maybe we just need uh, a new return code here. So the behavior would be, you can't do that? You cannot do that. I mean. So isn't there a few requests too big? Yeah, but but some some interpretation of it, it's too big that, you know, uh, to what you, to the, the buffer that you gave me or the size that you asked for. So, you know, at least yeah, like in. Is something specific too big for the session? I think so. If that's the case, there was some discussion on that. Uh, I don't remember. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll, sorry. Okay. Yeah, so you can do that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next. Set external attribute. Again, you're given a name and a value, um, and, and you save the external attribute. You, you have the option of. Um, replacing existing one if it's already there um, or just create and if it's already there you know you'll get rejected so mark i think if the only thing that can be returned is nfs4 okay you don't need i mean i'm sorry if there's no payload in the arm of the result right you don't have to give the union for the result i'll, I'll send you an email with a, an example of where to look at but i think the, the results part is yeah, I was trying to look at other implementation. I thought that, that was the way when you don't have anything returned. But you know, if it's a better but way to describe some it. some operations, they don't have a a, a for res because mm -hmm. all it can come back is the status. Right, return code. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Next. Remove basically given a name. You're going to remove that extend attribute <coughs> if you're permitted. Again, all those operations are very simple, dealing with one at a time. The first draft was, you know, overloading a bunch of different things to one RPC. And I think the recommendation, I think if it's from Christoph, was to break it down to simple operations. The next. And this, this is the more complicated one. And here um, we had to go to some model that uh, will allow you, if the, if the thing is, does not fit into the session uh, size, then you'll be able to come back with a cookie and it's basically the logic of a uh, reader that you can continue. This is basically just giving you the list of the names, not the actual values. Right. Uh, but again, they can be long, bigger than, you know, you can fit into one buffer. So you'll have the option of uh, reading them in, uh, in chunks and if so you're, you're not going to worry about, so with reader, you have not just max count, but max size of what you can return. Mm -hmm. You're not going to worry about that here? Uh, yeah, total. yeah, so you can say, I'll take this many entries, and you can also, but you also have to say, I have this much buffer space this, available. Clients, I have this much buffer space yeah. for all, all, of the, all the directories I'm doing. I'm right. Doing um, on, on, on the request? Yeah, the, the client when the client sends a reader request, it mm -hmm. says the bu the max buffer size that you can return to me. That's not max count. It's, well, that that's the question. Is it because it also tells it the max number of entries it can return? No, that that refers to the size of the buffer. Okay. And you, you fit as many as as you All can right. into that, and then um, if not, you, you return the cookie and the the verifier. Okay. Mark back to the error. Um, yes. There is a uh, request too big, which is defined as the compound request exceeds the channel's version of maximum size. Yeah, I know. Um, so that, that, that would not fit. I don't know why somebody was like. For a level too large yeah. on a server cost thing, level too large. But I thought that was the issue that, you know, that you can't, the, the get or the set can't, can't exceed the, the transfer. Right. That was, that, was, that was the issue. Right. Oh, we had both issues. Yeah, we did both. And I think that issue, the transport issue, is easy. The yeah, easy. arrow for it, it's, it's, it's done. equivalent to any other ball of data transport. Yes. The more interesting part is what we do about files to multiplications. And some of the files are actually have pretty arcane limitations. So it's sort of the same with the max count here for the reader, in the sense you have it. the file has a certain well, size above it. Well, that's, that's, that's the transport. Again, yeah, and on the file level, it's like there's 
different things. I mean, Boston's might have a limit for the length of the key. Oh, I see. They might have a limit for the length of a given value. They might have a limit for all the values for a file added up. Gotcha. And so I know at least Linux is pretty inconsistent with porting the OS, and I suspect the other OSs are better and probably different as well. Okay, so having a specific error for that. Yeah. Okay. It would be a good idea, but it would be harder to get the server story to be clear. So uh, I'll, I'll help you figure out if you can make sure that it makes sense for what I'm asking. Okay, next. Oh, as far as caching for XA and attributes, so the portrait deck is basically it's treated like any other attributes, you know, non data. Um, and the way that we um, notify the client that, uh, you know, something has changed with the, you know, change attribute. Uh, the rules, if you all, if you have a, if your client, uh, if you, the client does not have the legation, uh, then it, it, you know, it can cache the attributes and, you know, check, validate it basically with change attribute to see that he has up to date. Uh, but if he wants to update it, it should be done synchronous in case, uh, you know, somebody else has a delegation, um, or, you know, you just don't want to uh, keep it on your cache and, and you know, uh, assume that it's set and allowing other people to change it. So you'll have to uh, do it synchronously. Um, if you do have uh, delegations, then obviously you can uh, keep it in your cache, you know, for reading and writing. But, you know, you have to, um, if somebody um, sends you the callback for get attributes, you'll have to notify when you did change uh, the attributes. So we have the, the draft out there. Um, we hope that at this point it will become um, a working group document and, you know, get more. So, so procedurally, I thought we agreed the last meeting to make it a working group document. Yeah. So I think what you have to do is you have to take, um, you have to resubmit the draft in the, the draft dash IETF, whatever form. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, it'll send email to Spencer and BB uh, telling them that you're requesting it via a working group document and they'll promote it at that point. I see. I so mean, the next step is on you. No. I didn't realize that I, the last email I got from Spencer, it says, you know, submit the draft and then I'll make it a working attribute. I don't know yeah, what yeah, the yeah. word I'll, I'll send you the name you have to send to it. But basically okay. that's the procedure now, Marcus, for you to, to push them a, a, a version with the proper naming scheme and that'll start in motion. Okay. Um, we're going to start working on the development of um, uh, a reference implementation. Uh, we have the Ganesha server, which is user space, and it's very easy to implement on the server side. Uh, if anybody is in, interested on the client side, uh, you know, I'll be happy to work with you. Uh, but in any case, we'll, we'll have to make sure that something happens on both sides. Um, hope to get more feedback uh, on the draft once everybody reviews it. And uh, as we discussed before, I mean, we ought to maybe use the new model, uh, assuming it will be accepted uh, for my versions, where you can basically take one feature and move with it uh, independent of the rest. Uh, that's it. Is there any, was there another? Are they just the name of the questions? Okay. Thank you. Uh, block and SCSI layouts updates. Yeah. All right. Might as well move on to the next slide there. Uh, and then um, zoom it in. Oh, all right. So this is the the, the crazy world of uh, bypassing NFS for storage I/O and using good old block storage. 
that most people probably don't care about too much. Anyway, so we have the PNFS block layout RFC 5663 ratified uh, about five years ago in 2010. Um, I actually started implementing it, and it turned out that we actually needed a lot of errata to actually kind of make it work. And even then, it's still got a couple gapping holes. The first one isn't actually too bad because just efficiency. Um, the whole fencing situation is a little strange, and the protection against mounting the file system on the server on the client because they now have a shared block storage. It's also an evolving story, and we can move on to the next slide, which is talking about this a little more a little later. And so in terms of implementation on the client side, we've, we've got a Linux proof of concept client, I want to call it, that came from NetApp back then, which was merged in 2011. And I really don't even want to call it a prototype yet, because when I started using it, it literally fell apart in every way you could imagine. <laughs> So I was just running the basic false and test, like having huge data integrity holes, just corrupting data, crashing the kernel, easily exploitable. There are, as far as I know, no non-Linux clients. So even asking and figuring around, I haven't found one anywhere. Uh, on the server side, the first implementation was uh, from EMC in uh, VNX. They had a predecessor to that in earlier products, which wasn't standardized. And the Linux server that I wrote got merged early this year. And a nasty part there that people actually got upset about is because I assume no one would have even dared to use the client because it was so broken. But some people were using it as an early prototype against EMC. And the new Linux client and the EMC server don't interact. Actually, the old one didn't really do either, but people didn't notice because they weren't trying hard enough. And the problem is that the Linux virtual memory subsystem really doesn't support uh, file system blocks as an allocation unit that are bigger than the VM page size. And the old code kind of worked around it in a way that's very easily deadlockable. For the new one, I removed it, and there were two people that got a little upset about it, but it's not much I can help them right now. So to go back to the, the issues in detail with the with the um, spec outside the bits easily fixed by errata. Um, the, the real main issue is fencing. So whenever we've got a misbehaving client crashed or, or, or not responding to recalls, that's the main issue, we need to cut it off. And the traditional way to do this for block storage is, is to have fencing at the, at the switch level, sometimes at the array, but at least in the fiber channel world, the classic way to do it was at the switch. The problem is that the protocol doesn't really talk about the RFC for the protocol doesn't really talk about it. So it basically tells the MDS to fence the client. And the only thing the MDS knows about the client is the IP address it connected on, which kind of assumes A, that your block storage protocol is IP based. Yeah. B, assumes you're actually using the same IP address to connect to it. D assumes you have something in your storage stack that can actually fence based on an IP address. And all of that is actually not true for real world setups. And the other issue is discovery, how we actually find our block volumes that we want to directly talk to on the NFS client. And it's specified in a very, very generic way. So get device info basically says, oh, here's the signature. Look at every device you have at this offset for this signature, which works. It just does not work very efficiently on a setup that has a lot of uh, block devices. The other thing that also a bit of a downside, which I'm not that concerned about, is it requires you to previously set up your block storage. It's different from the object layout, which is also SCSI based which basically tells the client to actually create an iSCSI connection, which then ties them into iSCSI again. But, um, and the one thing because of these variable offset signatures is there's also basically no way to efficiently cache this because there's no framework this fits in. The, the client can't even cache it. So it literally has to go out 
to the device every time. And the third one was access protection. So our server has some sort of local file system. It might be clustered, it might be purely local, doesn't matter. And the clients can, in theory, just mount it. It's a real issue for, for, for the Linux server, which just uses XFS on there. The EMC one uses some bastardized version of UFS, which is one of the two UFS versions the Linux driver doesn't support yet, so they're safe for now until, <laughs> until the crazy Russian implements that support as well. Um, and the, the, try, the, the attempt fix for that is, an, and is another RFC, which is RFC 6688, which basically uses a partition format, a very common one now, the, the Intel EFI partitions, which most people use these days and basically has a special partition type that's a PNFS volume, which clients are not supposed to touch. It's not actually implemented anywhere, at least on the client side, as far as I know. It's very advisory. It requires your client to actually look at that. It's also mm, a little painful if your OS might be a client or a server, because that requires some configuration where you want to obey it and when not. Um, we already had that down, down, or did I, or did you have the slide mm -hmm. twice? Yes. Okay, sorry. Um, so what I tried to do to fix all these issues is I came out with a new draft for a new layout type, which I uh, called the SCSI layouts. And it literally takes everything that's in the block layout and tweaks a few bits and pieces. And the main feature here is that we use SCSI reservations or persistent reservations, which are used between different users of SCSI block storage to coordinate access to it. So basically you can cut off initiators from access at all. You can only give them read style access and there's all kinds of way to kick people out of that pool they're in. Um, and the other thing is that we're going to use SCSI specified identifiers to find our volume. So the, it's actually not the nicest spec for finding it because there's like seven different variants to actually identify a volume, but at least they're all standardized. Um, and this is how I came up with it. And the status is that I submitted a first personal draft in 2014. Uh, we got it accepted as a working group document in April. The changes have been pretty minor to the first version. I've got prototypes for the uh, client and server implementations, and I'm planning to actually get them up to full status and submit them really soon, which also means I really want to uh, get the um, draft moving forward. So um, you you can't fence on a file, you have to fence on a volume? Yeah, it's always on a volume basis. Okay. And on a, well, on a block device basis, yeah. which might be something different than an FS volume. So I need some additional reviews. Dave promised to do another deeper review. He already did a cursory one. I had a really good review from Robert Elliott on the SCSI side. I had you review on the NFS side. David Black just saying, I'll take a, I'll take a look at this. And yeah, the SCSI layout is doing, the, the SCSI layout is doing the right things. When we started working with what, what became the block layout, it predated, um, I think in one case it predated one of the mechanisms mechanisms that, that, that's being used, and I think the other case, there was it predated um, usable implementations of persistent reservations. So that is the part of the document, and the other one is that the way I've structured it right now, I really need an update to 5663 to incorporate the errata, or move to the next slide, what my other idea would be is one thing is we could try to divorce the SCSI layout from the block layout. So the way I wrote it right now is literally take the block layout XDR in description and here is a couple add-ons, which means it's a really small spec right now. It's 12 pages, including all the boilerplate, but the block layout is only 28 pages either. 
And the advantage would be a, that we get rid of out of this lockstep that we need to update 5663. It probably makes the spec a lot easier to read because that was actually one of the main confusion with the reviewers. Um, and it could actually allow changes to the existing XDR specified in block. And there's only two things I could come up with for that. And one is that I'd really like to reduce the size of the layout to make payload, which has giant waste in it right now. The other thing I could come up with in theory, but not in practice, is figure out if there's anything interesting layout specific we want to send in layout stats, which made it 242, which wasn't around at the time of the block layout yet. And on the next slide, I've got a little more detail on the layout commit uh, uh, payload. And right now, what the block layout says sends is an array of the PNFS uh, block extend structure, which is the same structure we use in, in layout get. And then has a device ID and offset in the file length and offset on the storage and the state. And the, state, the spec actually specifies the state must always be invalid anyway. So that's already taken out. And the way the server has to work, I'm pretty sure the server always needs to be able to look up which uh, which device ID and which storage offset it handed out for a given layout, because that's important for a commit, that's important for a recall. So the server really needs a tracking structure that taps from this to the two other members that matter. And if we can get agreement on that, we can literally shrink each record from 44 to 16 bytes. And given that on workloads that do small random writes, the commit payloads are huge. That would actually be a significant improvement in terms of network traffic. And that's pretty much it. Um, you have a comment? Uh, go, you go first, David. I'll go first, because I can put I can put on my 5663 author hat and say, yeah, do this. <laughs> um, if, if, if I understand what you said, it was basically, you, you've got a mutation of 5663 that sort of limps. You've got a better layout implementation that gets it right with respect to SCSI. And as part of that, you want to clean up the protocol. I don't see any reason to stick with the old protocol for the for the old layout, given the new layout is 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 going to is is going to have to do things differently anyhow, courtesy at least of persistent for of persistent reservations. Okay, so, so uh, this is Brian Plosky. Um So. Did I just hear you agree to proposal two to essentially supersede 5663 with a new document that combines both and is the SCSI layout document? I didn't hear that. No, I know it's two. I know it's two documents now, but so no errata. SCSI layout ought to be in a self-contained document. I okay, so you want two. Documents. I think that's I think that's clear. And then 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 um. A we could have a separate discussion about whether it's worth eradicating 5663 or abandoning it. Well, so the errata are filed anyway, but if we move on, and actually, I mean, it's okay. it's a I'm, I'm clear, clear, clearly a valuable document for running code. Here is the new SCSI, is the, is is the new SCSI layout document, and the 5663 plus errata is about as good as you're ever going ever going going to get it to limp. Okay, um, I'm I am jet lag, so let me try one more time. <laughs> yeah, I'm on two. Okay, <laughs> so you basically just said let's supersede 5663. No, what I, what I basically just said is that right now the Christoph schedule layout doc is written as a derivative of the of 5663. Yeah, two pages on means, top of the 27. Ten on top of 28. Yeah, which yeah, which, which, means, half of which is, means you you, you half of that is boilerplate. Let's see, which okay. means uh, six words in Christoph's mouth. Uh, it means you read 5663, get, get your mind warped, and then he'll unwarp it for you. Um, a self-contained doc in SCSI layout is the right thing to do there. And then independently, we can figure out if we want to do anything to 5663 or just leave it. Uh, okay. Okay. So I, the, 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 the distinction here, let me walk, walk slowly, is 5663 bits versus 5663 doc status. The new SCSI layout should pick up 5663 bits that make Christoph's new draft self-contained. Bits. Okay. Text. 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 
Yeah. Yeah. XDR. Okay. <laughs> 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 the XDR is extractable. Yeah. Um, okay. After that is done, we could then figure out whether it's worth reissuing 5663 to pick up his errata or just leave it. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. So the, the only other objection I heard a while ago, I actually should have done a slide on that, is there were a few people not directly involved concerned about non-SCSI block storage. Back then, I didn't see a contender. Now I'm actually involved with another contender, which is NVMe, especially in the Fabric version, which actually has persistent reservations and a SCSI compatible EVPD page these days. So you write another draft. No. <laughs> so the, the, the NVMe people actually have a mapping from SCSI to their protocol. Call, except that right now they're ignoring persistent reservations, but I might kick some of the working group people there to write that as well. So somebody else is going to write it. I'll try to make something. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to be dense here, but I just want to. I could write this down somehow. <laughs> Probably better off describing how to use the NVMe uh, bits and pieces directly. I'm also involved in NVMe that uh, re relying on that uh, SCSI translation doc in NVMe is a little risky. Probably better off uh, with a little, little bit of advice how to do it directly. Yeah, but I'm, I'm not sure. Well, I mean, the, the, the big option is do we describe it in terms of SCSI terms, which everyone knows, or are we going to come up with our own abstraction, which we then need to map to the terms? I would, off the top of my head, I'm also, let's see, BB's jet lag, my, my coffee's not working, not working yet. <laughs> what I would do is I would, I would write the, the main spec the way you're currently writing in terms of skies. Everybody knows that. And then add something to it, a section annex or something that says, oh, if you want to make it work over NVMe, here are the six things you've got to understand about how NVMe is not exactly skies, but close enough. All right. Okay. Yes, that's it. Thank you. So I will upload a new version that unties, but it has no other changes for now. And we'll do it from there. Okay, uh, Tom, you're up. Next slide. <laughs> I did that on purpose. Okay. So uh, we're talking about the flex files uh, layout. Uh, I want to recap it. We went through the working group last call, and my best advice is to be very careful about the wordings of some sections. Uh, so we talked about uh, synthetic UIDs, which is how we allow for fencing. I made the mistake of labeling the title security instead of client fencing and of course that pulls people out of the woodwork like crazy right so uh i got a lot of discussion well it's actually very good in that it, it taught me my lesson because when i push this up to the next level if it had the word security there i would really drive the cockroaches yeah, out that's right. <laughs> so uh a very good process the the lesson is is this the synthetic uids are not security in any sense of the, the word um I think I have the next slide that'll talk about it. So the again, the synthetic UIDs are, are strictly there as a means of doing fencing. And if you want Kerberos, don't use the loose coupling. Use the tight coupling. Don't use the synthetic UIDs. Have the same UID or whatever attached to both the MDS and the DS for the storage. If you want to use loose coupling, my suggestion is that's more of an implementation choice than a, a spec definition. So, for example, you could take the MDS and you could make it a KDC such that it's issuing tickets to the client that work for both uh, the file on the MDS, the metadata file, and then the data part portion that's on the DS. Uh, I've had several other suggestions of ways this could be done, but they all turn out to be very implementation specific rather than we, do we want to specify this in the spec? And again, this comes back to this is not the, the synthetic UIDs are not a security model; they are a fencing model. Yeah. Next. Yep. Yeah, uh, so the 
So the big change in the document from version five to version six was uh, clarifying that about the fencing model and then the stats. Um, so, you know, wearing my other hat with my company, we go through doing uh, an implementation of the flex file server. And uh, we wanted to separate read versus write so that we don't have to keep a timestamp consistent on them both. And we wanted to make the updates be cumulative. Uh, so we've done that. So then we then separate, I'll, I'll have an, in a moment on another slide, but we separate basically between operations and bytes. What type of operations were sent, what's the count on them, and then the bytes, what's, what's requested and completed. And then we finally also wanted to track bytes not delivered. Right, so what did we ask for and what did the, what came out as a problem because of the uh, errors? Can we advance this? Yeah. So we have this uh, structure of IO latency for, uh, we have the operations requested, operations completed, bytes requested, bytes completed, and then the bytes not delivered, we just talked about. And then we have the, the busy time, which I forgot to write down and I'm, I'm jet lagged as well and the aggregate completion time. So busy time is how much time I spent. No, I'm, I'm brain dead. It's, I'll, I'll read it again. I'm, uh, Tron actually wrote this part, so. Uh, and then the, the aggregate completion time, how long does it take to complete the request down, to, if it's a write, down to stable storage, if it's a read, to, to come back, please. So the status, we, uh, we actually tested this at the last Bakathon, we brought our server and we were able to get it up and running the first day. And uh, we've already delivered the client into the Linux kernel. Uh, we sent Wireshark patches upstream for the layout type and they've been accepted. So you can uh, you know, decode this. And it's time for another working group last call. Mm -hmm. Right, my goal is to get these, uh, the, uh, the layout type assigned to us before Christoph's document. So, uh, should we just do it together? Yes. Are we going to erase? No, so actually, Christoph's other hat will get him in trouble if he goes, because it's already in the Linux kernel as four. And so that would be a problem there. The, that might be a good reason for the work, work, working group to decide if you get that value. Yeah, we, well, we had, we had the discussion last time um, about. Oh, should, that four. Yeah. <laughs> so, so David, we actually had the discussion about making it formal. And we said, no, it's just going to go through. Don't worry about it. OK. I should say this to the mic, um, David Black. Running code is a real good reason for the working group to uh, to to assign values to layouts. Right. So it's what what whatever doesn't break running code will 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 go over just fine with, with anyone who cares. Yes. So. Uh, I, I, yeah, we're, we're going to keep the values assigned. Done. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Let me see the slide. Back. Okay. Uh, we have one agenda add. Uh, we have another, I have another slide there. Oh, shoot. Why did I miss something? Never mind. Wait, Andy. Sit. Sit. Oh, 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 I see what I did. All right, so requirements for layout types. Uh, could we advance, please? <laughs> so it lives. If you remember, actually, the, this is the, the closest I've come to reusing a slide deck. I wanted to keep the same titles from last time and the, the same content. Last time it said it lives, exclamation mark. This time it lives. So there was confusion on the status. We had, um, I, I had thought an email was shared that went to the whole working group basically that said, uh, since we've changed from an info to a standard, here's a set of issues. And uh, that only came to me evidently. And so I, I, I thought, well, we're not proceeding with this. I have to go address these comments. And then I started getting email from IESG about, oh, we're reviewing your document, and this, this, and this. I'm like, very confused. Uh, so it, it actually went through the IES, IESG. There were some comments I did not address. Uh, I will address them, but you know, we, we 
we had this, I think David finally sent out the email last week saying here are the, the set of objections I have that since we went from info, that's very inf informational to us, a standard he wanted us to, to be a little bit more stricter about. So, so where, where does it sit right now? Is it, is so th those, those finally came out and I think Martin's going to talk. So we'll look at that. Because I, I read also in David's comments and I think the document needs to be more work. Yeah, so that's Martin Stimelay speaking. Right? It's just sent to the working group. So oh, okay. that you have time to work on the comments and then you can go yeah, through a yeah. working group last call, ITF last call yeah. okay. again. So we're resetting back to, yeah. it's back in the working group. Okay, okay, that's good. I just wanted to explain why we were doing right, it. I get it. <laughs> yeah. it is pretty circuitous. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. So action plan, I think this recaps what we just said. We're going to, I, I want to address Dave's comments. Um, I, I want to be very clear, they, they were all valid comments. It was just, I, emotionally, I said, we're done. And then I get this large detailed document mm -hmm. and I'm like, ah, right. I thought I was done and changing one word on the document changed the whole thing, whatever. So I want to address the issues raised in the, oh, so I want to address Dave's comments first because that'll dictate how I do the next part, which is to address the issues raised in the IES, ESG. Uh, I have to engage them early. I have to go address those before we send it back out for another working group last call and then send it back to the IESG. It's uh, the nice thing about having detailed comments is you can go address them uh, individually very succinctly. Uh, it was just, the, again, the sheer magnitude of the email versus where I thought I was that I just shut down. That plus life, you know. Um, I don't think there's, a, is there another page? Nope. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, Again, it's it's mainly providing detail now that we're very, you know, going to be much more standardized. Nothing else? I think you're up. Yeah. <laughs> All right, this is Andy Adamson. I don't have any slides on this, but uh, the multi-domain uh, draft that I've been working on for several years now. It's sort of it's sort of similar to the layout types in the sense that it's it's clarifying some of the uh, the issues that are that are you know presented inside uh, the the NFSP 4.0 and 4.1 drafts on uh, on how do you run a multi-domain uh, namespace, uh, especially with FedFS. So um, right now it's a standards level draft. Um, it's gone through a lot of review. Where does it stand? Is it is it a working group last call? Is it? Um, I, I asked for that. I don't think it, I don't know if it made it yet. I don't think so. I have to find out. Um, and I, I I think it's a valid question whether it should be a you know informational draft or a or standards draft. Um, I'm I'm willing to have it go either way. But uh, the reason I bring it up with the layout. Layout types draft is, you know, when I read through the layouts type, I felt very similar in the sense you were bringing out issues that were, you know, that were scattered, that were said inside the other the other draft inside a, a 5661, the layout types, uh, but it was scattered all over the place and your draft brought it all together so you could read it in one place and understand how things actually worked. And that's very similar to what I'm doing with the, the multi-domain draft in the sense that, you know, some things are, are sort of obvious, but when you put them all together, you, you, it makes it very clear as to how do you run one of these things. So. So I guess my questions are, number one, should it be an informational versus standard, and where does it sit right now? And uh, I think it's a, a worthwhile document to get printed out in, in one of the two forms. Um, any advice from anybody on this? So, Martin, David, Tom? Yeah, if, if it's, is it intended to be uh, the reference? Is it intended to say, this is what you, sh you will do? Well, there's a couple of musts in there. Some of some of them come from, you know, capital must. Some of them come from the uh, the draft and uh, five six six one, and some of them don't. Such so for as for instance, uh, you must not use auth sys. <laughs> um, but the, it could be worded as an informational draft, and it would be it would serve its purpose in that way as well. There's there's no protocol in you know just like the layouts type. There's no there's no protocols pieces inside it. It's just how how to run everything. David. I'm going to look at Martin as I say this, but my recollection is that with suitable disclaimers, and we can find you the magic word, 
experts. 2119 musts, shoulds, and mays can be used in informational doc. Good. And I think this is, I think information is probably correct because on the one hand, you're telling protocol designers how to get it right. Yes. But on the other hand, you're not actually specking the protocol. Exactly. So, so I mean, it, however it works to, to get this document out to be useful is what I want. <laughs> so, I believe, I vaguely recall writing a sentence or two basic, uh, on, a, on a corresponding doc that basically said, must, should, and may here reflect design requirements as opposed to implementation, implementation requirements. Oh, I see. That's not interesting. So it depends a bit on if you're just repeating things and, and making it more clearer. Yeah. Or for instance, in the layout document, it was like giving additional advice or making things more complete. There, there's additional advice in here. Yeah. Because, you know, you keep, there's some things you just can't do, you know. Um, okay, but it's not specified in the original document. Correct. Okay, then that, that's probably wise to put this on standard stuff. All right, so. Because you're extending. Yeah, extending what's, what's going on. Yeah. Okay, well, fine then. Because then, it, then I think it's in good form. It's been reviewed many times. And, uh, you know, so perhaps I should ask for it to be in the working group last call if this is the case. Uh, and have another one review. It's a very short draft. Oh, just uh. Uh, there's no errata to speak of, just additional information. Yes. Okay. Right. Yeah. So uh, just go ahead and change the the info to standard. It's and already it's in standard now. I never put it back into info. It was one of the okay. issues that was that was brought up, and I thought it was valid enough to just have a quick discussion here at, at the meeting about it. So it's already in, it's already as a standards draft. I, right. I think it's good to go. So, um, so I the, know everybody's been really busy with lots of other drafts, so it's, it's just... So the, the, the summary is both the layout types, no, I'm sorry, both the flex files and this document we want to put into working group last call. Sure, yes. Has yours, has, has yours gone through working group last call? I requested it, and I sort of got silence, and I believe the response was that there's too many documents <laughs> uh, being pushed through at the moment, and so I sort of waited. Right. So. So I think um, it's coming up for a refresh. I'll refresh it and ask to be in working group last call. I mean, I actually, we should be able to take a look at the name and see, what, see what's going on with it. So I haven't. All right. So thank you. That is all on the agenda. Any comments from my area director or anything? <laughs> was, did, did anybody ever show up? on the jabber outside of this room? <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, it, uh, everybody signed blue sheet. There's nobody walked in and out of here while we were sitting there. Okay. Um, if there's no other comments and stuff, I'll declare the meeting finished. Hey, Lars disappeared on me. Wasn't he here before? Yes. Okay. I just want to make sure I'm, <laughs> I'm imagining things because <laughs> I got his cable. That's it. That's why I want him. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Yep. All right. I sent Martin. I sent you the uh, thingy. Yeah, send it. Oh, thank you. Okay, if they say no, let me know. I'll hold back on the minutes until I'm um, just. Okay. I guess there will, there will be some Okay. So I, I don't see that it ever went through the work of the last call. Yeah, okay. So I'll make sure that. Uh, I see you requesting it. Yeah, so maybe I'll just uh, yeah. request it again. I'll, I'll, I'll well, it should be in the meeting notes to be pretty clear in the meeting notes that's being requested. Okay, so I'll just go ahead and send it the name change. Yeah, I think so. Well, actually, I see it. Draft IETF for a multi year network request for one. So. so that means it's a working group document. Yeah, it doesn't mean that's stuff. Okay, you want to see a printer demonstration? This is really cool. All right. Sure. All right. <laughs> okay. So I have app here. 
Okay, Polaroid app, Bluetooth connected. Quick print, go to gallery, get picture of cheese. Okay, good. So <laughs> it shows up on here. <laughs> and you hit the print button on the bottom and it sends the image. Sends a cheese over the Bluetooth. Yeah. <laughs> Blue cheese, there it is. All right. So this, this is how long it takes. Hold on. Hold on. We're almost there. You should watch it come out. It's kind of cool. You know? Okay. Hold on. Here. I'll, I'll do all the like this. Okay. I think it works like this. Yeah. Hold on. Here. I mean, this is, I find this completely fascinating. <laughs> it's a printer. Which I dropped in a taxi last night and Lars recovered from me. I got my room and I'm like, where's my fucking printer? We're not official anymore. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't work sideways. Is it zero seats? Makes a quarter of the class. Check this out. <laughs> that is hilarious, isn't it? It's probably running Linux, you know. <laughs> but this is the this is the cheese we had last night. Look at the look at the color rendering. It's not bad for quickie stuff. Only costs three dollars. <laughs> Actually, the, the print paper isn't that expensive, but this sort of, I think it's cheaper than buying, I'm, I think it's cheaper than what Polaroid film used to cost per print. And, and you print it from this instead of like carrying around a gigantic camera. Uh, no ink. Interesting, eh? It's a zinc. <laughs> Zero, I guess that's what it means. I never thought about it. Uh, thermal. All right. Thermal and it's um it's uh the the temperature is uh rendering the dye layers um depending on how they what temperature they hit it at or something like that I don't know I, I read about it sounded quite interesting. I don't know they didn't call it that it's a. Uh, Even bigger printers that use uh, dye sublimation techniques, uh, thermal to the, basically sublimate dye off the, off yeah. the lead. Cool stuff. These things like hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah, this is, uh, I think, 149, 139 or something like that. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to. And yeah, I have this free cable that came with it. Oh, it came with Yes, I know. It's like a 3D I was doing something. Chuck was calling it to me as a joke, and someone heard it and just went with it. I'm like, 
No, somebody has to be the editor. So yeah, yeah. Children have it. Your name got associated with it. Yeah. Uh, are you going to anoint him for the jabber? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Richard, what color? To go find what? Um, I'm hoping. I was going to ask. Could, no, no, let's not. I don't think Mike's the type that likes that kind of stuff. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna deposit the blue sheets at the blue sheet deposit box. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, did you have breakfast, Christoph? Christoph, did you eat breakfast? Did you eat breakfast? No. You want to try to grab something out of beer? <laughs> well, I've been I've been like holding off on beers this entire trip, so. Listen, yesterday I came around this time of day, I was sitting at the old Tennessee, Indiana, and had a beer for breakfast. <laughs> yeah, I, I been good. I told you I've been good. I walked past the. Uh, I almost stopped at uh, the Pilsner Urkel place in uh, Pilsner Urkel, whatever it is, in the airport. But uh, I decided to get my bag instead. What's the plan for tonight? Oh, I was Somebody gave me a recommendation on a restaurant here. Oh, the um, the big round table thing we did. Two thousand seven. No, too You got your thing. Let me clean up. I would have 